Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, my great uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor David Lee from University of Toronto. Uh, David is going to tell us about uh, a very exciting uh, uh, virtual machine security project on how to split interfaces, making the trust between application and operating system configurable. Thank you, Helen. OK, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about work uh, done with uh, my students, Richard Tamin and Lionel Liddy. Um, and uh, we're from the University of Toronto. And this is work that's going to appear uh, in OSDI this year. So today I'm talking about how to make trust between applications and operating systems configurable. So let's start with the problem. Um, the problem is that a lot of commodity operating systems are very insecure these days. And uh, the reason for this is that a lot of applications need full privileges to run on, the, uh, on, the, on commodity operating systems. So they need administrator privileges. And, and um, if they're attacked, this can give uh, the attacker a lot of control. So these, because of the large amount of code that is privileged on the system, this gives the attacker a lot of targets to hit. And so this means that the attacker can easily gain those privileges by finding a vulnerability, just one of those vulnerabilities in any one of those um, applications. And since that's a large code base, this happens fairly frequently. Once the attacker is in control of these privileged applications, the attacker can typically extend that control to basically compromise and take control of the operating system kernel. Um, this is because uh, commodity system kernels typically don't isolate themselves very well from privileged applications. Attackers can install new drivers, new modules, and inject code into the kernel. Once the attacker is in control of the kernel, then all is pretty much lost. The attacker can attack various applications, and also security sensitive applications, that is, uh, applications that have some security implication are also vulnerable. So we, what we'd like to do is somehow protect those security sensitive applications from the kernel. So if the attacker, even if the attacker has control of the kernel, when the attacker tries to attack the application, the security sensitive application has some defenses. On the other hand, it's hard to remove the security sensitive application completely from the operating system. And that's because applications typically depend on the operating system for various services and access to resources. For example, the operating system typically provides a file system. And you'd want the uh, security sensitive application to be able to access, still be able to access files on the commodity OS kernel's um, disk. So, how are we going to solve this dilemma where you have applications that don't want to trust the OS, but at the same time want to access OS resources? Well, our solution is called Proxos, and I'm going to give you a brief overview of um, how it works here. So here I have a diagram of um, our commodity OS again. So there are other applications that the security sensitive application might interact with. And there's also an OS kernel that handles access to hardware resources and provides an interface that the application is used to talking to. Now, one thing that you might want to do is move the security sensitive application into another virtual machine and implement various virtual machines with a virtual machine monitor. So now the security sensitive application is isolated from the commodity OS kernel because it's in a separate virtual machine, and the virtual machine monitor enforces a very strong sort of isolation between the two. So now we've protected the security sensitive application from the commodity OS, but how are we going to let the security sensitive application talk to the commodity OS? Well, first, the security sensitive application doesn't know it's been taken out of the OS kernel environment. So it's going to go ahead and make system calls and expect some operating system to handle those system calls. So First, we implement a private operating system that handles um, system calls, certain system calls from the security sensitive application. Um, so this, we call it a private operating system because it's private to the security sensitive application. It's, um, its, own, its only job is to handle the request from that application. And in a sense, it's private to the application. It, it doesn't handle requests from any other application. And then we implement a small module called Proxos. And what Proxos does is for accesses to sensitive resources, Proxos will route those system calls to the private operating system. However, for non-security sensitive resources, resources that are safe to keep 
on the OS kernel because they don't hold any sensitive data or, or have any security sensitive implication, Crossos will continue to route those to the commodity OS VM. And the way it does that is it routes it to a host process. And what this host process does is basically it's the security sensitive application's host on the commodity OS. And then the host process executes the system calls that the security sensitive application wants to do uh, for it. So it executes system calls on behalf of the security sensitive application in the commodity OS. So here I show the security sensitive application using the host process to send some information to the other applications. Maybe a signal or it could be talking via pipe um, or some sort of IPC. Likewise, the security sensitive application can also access resources in the commodity OS kernel. So it can access the kernel's file system, it can access uh, network devices, whatever it wants, again, through the host process. So in a sense, um, this is what Proxos does, and the name basically comes from proxy operating system. And the reason we name it this is that Proxos is not really an operating system per se. It doesn't really implement any of the functionality you'd normally associate it with an operating system. Rather, it acts as an operating system proxy for these two operating systems, simply taking requests and redirecting them to the real operating system that, that is sitting in front of. Um, and the way it routes those requests or determines which requests to route where are set by the application developer. The application developer knows best which requests that the sensitive application is making, which ones are security sensitive and which ones are not. So the application developer has to tell Proxos via a set of rules which system calls should be routed where. Uh, one more thing um, that we did was, because the private OS only supports this application, the private OS can essentially trust the application in its entirety. It doesn't need to isolate that application from any other application, nor does it need to isolate, isolate other applications from the security sensitive application. So in our system, everything on the private VM side is actually running in one single address space. Moreover, it's actually just one binary where everything is linked together statically. Are you going to describe these rules out there? Yeah, that's, that, I'm going to talk about that. So this is just um, a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. So I'll talk about the implementation. And in there is basically how these rules are set, as well as uh, modifications to existing systems we have to make uh, in our prototype. Uh, I'll talk about some representative applications that we uh, move to Proxos. And uh, talk, finally, I'll talk about the effort that you it, that is required to move an application to process as well as a performance implication. Okay, so there's a lot of text on this slide, but it, um, what I want to basically draw your attention to is this box here, which shows you an example of the routing rule language that we are using to specify the rules. And the language is actually very simple. Um, in every routing rule specification, there's basically two parts. In the first part, there are tuples. Um, let me just, yeah, there we go. So there are tuples here that specify a resource class, a name of an element on that resource, and then a set of methods located in the private OS that are going to handle system calls or accesses to that resource. So you would do this basically for every secure, um, sensitive resource that your application is going to access. And then the second part of the rules is basically a table um, of system call handlers or methods located in the private OS that, are gonna, that, are, that um, process is going to use to access those resources. So what this rule is saying here is that um, when accessing Etsy Shadow, since Etsy Shadow is sensitive, um, process should direct accesses to Etsy Shadow. For example, if it's using open, it should use the private open function in the private OS. Similarly, close should be directed to the private close function, so on and so forth. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, basically, you just indicate which resources are sensitive and which uh, methods in the private OS should handle those sensitive resources. And anything that's not named in this um, rule is then by default directed to the commodity OS. That means anything that's not named here is going to be uh, non security sensitive. So, are there situations where you want this to be data sensitive? I mean, this is all based on, on control operations. So, if there's a packet and it's coming down and the packet has a particular payload, that way, otherwise, that way. 
like packet filtering in a, I see. in a network or something. So there's no need to do any any sort of data sensitive. We code. haven't run into that problem. Um, so again, it's a fairly new system, so we haven't ported a lot of applications. But in the ones that we've thought of, um, we we don't see a need for that. So that's something data sensitive, right? I mean, the the open call. Well, yes, it is. It's resource name sensitive, I guess. Yeah. Argument to okay, I guess I'm wrong. I mean, well, how, how, where is it mentioning the data? How is it data? So the NC shadow there. So, so the open call has arguments, right? And one of them is path name, and they've they've got to be they've got to be routing that call based on what the arguments to open are. And, and, I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing that. I, I, I think the key is it's data sensitive in the sense that it ha it's sensitive to the name of the resource, but not to the contents of the resource. So, in in the question before. He was asking whether um, you could route based on the contents of a packet. Or in this case, the parallel thing would be, can I route based on what line I'm accessing in SC Shadow or something like that? And um, because process is operating at the operating system call level, system call level, it's really dealing with objects, operating system level objects. So typically, the operating system is not aware of individual lines um, in um, in a file, for example. Oh, so, I, but, but, but I didn't understand that. So, but you're, you're saying that it is that you're specifying this for this particular file, these operations. That's so right. it is data sensitive in the sense of the file name. Yeah, so, uh, so, right. It's not in the much, contents. How, how detailed yeah. you can get. Right, right, right. right. So, so. But this has to be. But this has to be again. Uh, this is a fairly static declaration. Still, you're. you're that's right. Oh, okay. That's right. So the. The, I guess the intuition is that applications typically keep sensitive data all in one file or one in operating system object. And you wouldn't typically want to route between them. Now, one, one example that I have thought of where this isn't true is some, maybe something like the Windows registry. So that's something that we can talk about more. But my understanding, again, um, you guys probably know more, is that is, it is a bit like a file system. So if you go up into the library layer, you can get those that kind of semantics too. So yeah, on a, on a related note, you're, you're, you're labeling, you're, you're naming the object Etsy Shadow. Is that kind of what's the binding for that? Are you does that get resolved? I mean, at, at the system call level, as the calls are coming out of that, right. that, that I'll, I'll talk about the specific implementation of that later. Right, right now, I just want to get the conceptual idea of the routing rules across. So, so maybe yeah. there could be this hierarchy. Yes. Essentially, it could be a registry, a file system, yeah. whatever, and you could you can label that hierarchy with. Uh, method tables. Right, right. And I, I guess um, you mentioned it's static. This is static, but I, I should mention that there's no reason why it has to be a fixed string. You can use regular expressions in there, and we do do that to make, make the writing of the rules simpler, because sometimes you want to protect an entire directory. OK, so um, <coughs> by specifying basically which system calls or which access to resources go where, what the application developer is doing is essentially partitioning the interface between the application and the operating system into accesses to sensitive resources and accesses to non-sensitive resources. And I want to emphasize here that our, the security of the application uh, under our system is predicated on the developer correctly doing this. So if the developer forgets to uh, label some resource as security sensitive, uh, process will simply route that by default to the commodity OS, and that, that could be undesirable. So, so this has to be done by someone who is fairly knowledgeable and understands the semantics of the application. So um, we've implemented a prototype of our system, and, uh, and we use the Zen Virtual Machine Monitor to do this, and we're using Linux as our commodity OS. And uh, what I'm going to show you here is basically how a user running on the Commodity OS might start a private uh, secure application in Proxos. So what the user first does is basically he or she initiates or starts the host process. Um, and the host process is specially written so that it, it where, it's aware it's a host process. And what it'll do is it'll make a system call to the Linux kernel. And this is a special system call that we've added to the Linux kernel where the host process basically indicates to the Linux kernel what private application um, it wants to be associated with. The Linux kernel then forwards this request to the Zen Virtual Machine Monitor, um, just naming the, giving the name of the application. And Zen takes that name and translates it into a binary located on a partition that is separate from the Linux OS kernel. So the commodity OS basically has no access to the binary of the private application, nor does it have access to the startup parameters of that application. 
So Zen takes that, applic um, that application, which is a, really a virtual machine image, and initializes it and instantiates the virtual machine. And the virtual machine contains within it uh, the private application and a version of Proxos uh, compiled with the routing rules specific to that application. And so now when that private application wants to make a system call that's going to be routed to the commodity OS, Proxos routes that, commodity, uh, that request to the Linux kernel, which then sends it to the host process to execute. And it's very important here that the Linux kernel always sends it to the host process that initiated the private VM in the first place. So this invariant is basically very carefully maintained by our system that the host process and the private VM, once the host process starts at private VM, the two are forever bound. And any requests from the private VM always go back to that same host process. So how does the communication from process to the host process actually take place? It's, a, it's, a, it's an RPC mechanism, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So um, it's a good question. Um, but basically, the point I want to get across here is that because these two are bound from the Linux or the commodity OS's kernel's point of view, this private application is basically contained within this host process. And what this means is that while the private application doesn't have to trust the commodity OS, the commodity OS doesn't have to trust the private application any more than it has to trust a regular process on the system. Because since it's contained within here, this private application has no more powers on the commodity OS system than this host process that started in the first place. So even if the private application is malicious, or uh, in collusion with the user, the user can abuse it to, for example, escalate privileges on the commodity OS any more than he or she could without the private application. All right, so there was a question about how these system calls are forwarded. Um, basically, uh, to sum up, it's a very, it's just a basic RPC type mechanism. Um, when the private application and VM are instantiated, a shared buffer is created between the private VM and the commodity OS um, uh, VM. So this is a shared region in memory. And when uh, the private application wants to forward um, a system call to the commodity OS, it simply does so by putting the arguments of the system call in the shared buffer and then sending a virtual interrupt to the commodity OS, which the commodity OS uh, receives with its interrupt handler. And Zen here basically sets the source of all these virtual interrupts so that um, the commodity OS always knows exactly which private VM um, uh, uh, was the source of the interrupt. So um, basically, if you, can, you could have more than one private application running, and the commodity OS would also always be able to find the right host application to associate with that by looking at the source of the interrupt. So once a commodity OS knows which uh, host process to start, uh, to, sorry, to handle the system call, it basically wakes up that host process. Normally, the host process is sleeping when it's not um, being used to execute system calls. So it wakes it up and indicates that there is a uh, system call waiting for it in the shared buffer and tells it where the shared buffer is. The host process then executes the system call on behalf of the other side, puts the result into the shared buffer, and then uh, sends a virtual interrupt back to the private, uh, private VM. And then process can then consume those arguments and continue on. Um, one performance optimization we made here is that we know that the host process is not really doing anything. We, even when signaled, all it's going to do is drop back down in the kernel to execute a system call anyways. So we save that extra trip up into user space and back by simply altering the scheduler to be aware that if it's a host process, then it knows that it's going to be waken up to do a system call. So it looks at the system call request and just jumps to the system call handler. So this helps a bit because that means we don't have to go into the user space and trap back into the kernel. <coughs> Another thing Proxos provides is basically a way to um, get uh, a secure, trusted path between the application and the user. So typically, applications require on the commodity OS to act as an intermediary between the application and the user. Um, this can be bad because there could be spyware on the commodity OS, or the commodity OS could be, uh, could be um, either reading the screen or, log or, or logging keystrokes. So to avoid having to go through the commodity OS for access to the user, uh, what we do is we instantiate another VM with uh, basically user I.O. functions. So in this case, we have an X server running inside this VM. And now when the private application wants to send something to the user, the private application, of course, doesn't know that it's um, in a private VM. 
it simply goes ahead and writes to the uh, socket where it would normally expect to find the X server. So here it's writing to the X socket. Uh, the developer writes rules and process to route requests to that X socket, um, basically that socket to the private OS. And then we have methods in the OS that will translate those writes to that socket whoops, uh, into writes to the X server here by going through the VM. So basically, instead of um, writing directly, writing to the commodity OS here, those rules are translated by the private OS into writes to this share, uh, trusted X server. And then that, that X server displays the result to the user. So we can see here that um, these requests don't have to go through the commodity OS VM at all. In fact, the commodity OS VM could have a separate X server. And so the user would be able to uh, easily differentiate between uh, which requests are coming from the private OS because they appear in one server and which requests come from the commodity OS because they appear in another server. Which process, which, excuse me, which VM created the trusted display VM? Uh, this one? This one's always there. So in essence, uh, in our implementation, there's a root VM, and then each one, each one of these are nested X servers. And that, as part of these calls, this private OS, uh, the first time you have an X um, message, it tells the root X server to create a nested one just for that VM. So you have a nested X server for every, every private application and one for the commodity OS. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <clears throat> Doesn't say, uh, you said something about linkage previously between the private VM and the entity that created it. And this seems to be a different I see. Um, yeah. You, you could think of this as basically a part of the trusted computing base. It's, it's, part of the, it's something that the VM provides, sorry, something the VMM provides as a service to uh, private applications and the commodity OS. So the linkage is prov provided by the VMM in a sense. So it seems like as we kind of add more and richer forwarding mechanisms that in the limit, it's just a why not just use the existing network mechanisms? Why, why don't I just use a Zen VM, ignore, ignore the fact, and why, why is this tightly coupled to the VM? Why, why don't I just pretend it's just a bunch of machines connected by a network, and when I, want a, when I want a private display, I have one of the machines gets the display, and it provides an X server. And, you know, and, I, and I do the forwarding with you know, X network calls, or, or you know, VNC network calls. And, you know, I mean, why, why don't, and, and if the private VM wants to use this guy's file system, well, we use a remote file system. Why, I mean, why are, there, why are there new mechanisms here? Why are we, what are we getting out of the, the specialization? Um, so that's a good question. The question is, why don't, why don't we just use um, regular TCP IP or network type communication? And you could. Um, the thing is, we're not really adding that many new me mechanisms. We're not adding new mechanisms at all to the VMM, because the VMM already has private interrupts. And it's already using shared buffers between virtual machines to implement um, driver forwarding. So okay. in fact, um, the, uh, you know, in layers inside each of the virtual machines, right? I mean, I, I, in, instead of forwarding calls just with the network, I'm now doing this sort of this new special kind of forwarding. Well, and, in I, essence, the, the sorry, sorry to interrupt, but um, the uh, the forwarding here is actually a lot simpler than uh, network forwarding because if I were going to forward this as a network packet, I would have to implement a full t full network stack there. Um, it's a lot simpler to implement. Efficiency, or are you making an argument about size? Effort? I'm talking about actually amount of code, TCB size. So you're talking about the, the runtime overhead, not about the engineering. That's the computing overhead. thing. That too, but I'm also talking about the amount of code you need to implement on this side. So, I mean, it seems like, I mean, I can build all this today without writing any low-level code, right? By by by, built, by putting these pieces together. That's not well. That's that's true and not completely true. Yeah. So, so, so I would like to emphasize that this, uh, this, this, this entire unit here, minus a private application, is 10,000 lines of code. So I, I challenge you to find me a, a good TCP IP stack that's around that small. The other thing is, is not a, so we've tried it, but it's not that straightforward to rip TCP IP code out of an existing kernel. Reducing the size of the tax surface inside that box. Um, that, and also, also I, I, I'm not sure it's necessarily going to be simpler, even from a just a pure engineering time perspective, because the interface we're talking about here is actually very simple. And even if you have existing as an existing TCP/IP stack, it's hard 
you know, there's some work involved taking it out of this regular kernel and just having it stand alone. Yeah, so. I mean, how does the commodity OS do display? Does it have to go through the trusted display VM? Yeah, yeah, it does too. But the trust, so the trusted display VM knows about um, each requester. So if there was, if the commodity OS is making a request to the X server, the X server, this trusted VM knows that that request is coming from this guy, this request is coming from this guy. So it can keep them separate in different separate X nests. So if I understand it, what, what you said is basically you've, you've assigned the graphics, the display hardware to that trusted display. VM. Yes, you can look at it exactly that way. Right, so yeah. why don't you just factor the whole hardware subsystem so that you have so that you have a trusted a trusted mm -hmm. file system and a trusted and that everybody goes and uses those entities oh i think you're asking a factor so i'm not i'm not so you're you're saying mm -hmm. why just do this you you've got a service there that's display right right and you and you give it some hardware resources and other stuff why not create another VM that's got file system? Oh, I see. Basically, um, you just factor the entire commodity. You know, so you, you you take all the services out and put them in trusted VMs. Okay. And then, so so the distinction has, here is that there the X server here is not providing any resources that should be shared <coughs> amongst these. So it's a it's doing a much simpler thing. Sorry, it's the X server here is not providing a resource that needs to be shared between the private VM and the commodity OS. So it's doing a much simpler job. All it needs to do is keep. Well, they're sharing the display. But there's no information flow between them, right? But while in this case, what we're providing is the ability for the private VM to actually take information from the commodity OS and read it, or similarly, write information it has into the commodity OS to be stored on, let's say, the commodity OS's file system. So there's a distinction there. So, but I'm, I'm sorry to belabor this, but, but I, you said there's a commodity OS file system. Uh, what if the file system was factored out of the commodity OS and turned into a service the same way the trusted display is? So that you know anybody who wanted to go get file system services goes to the trusted file system VM, just like they go to the trusted display VM. That um, and so I guess the distinction here is how much, how much, um, how much policy and how much, tr how much work those would have to do. So to support the same thing that we are trying to support here. So in this case, we are able to factor this X server out because, for example, <laughs> we wouldn't allow um, the this the private OS to make. X server calls such that I could see what the commodity OS is doing. And likewise, the commodity OS couldn't make X server calls to see what X messages the private OS is doing. Basically, there's no information flow between them inside this X server. The X server just serves, you could think of this X server, like we use an X server as, um, as a tool just for simplicity. You could think of this as just as a, as a frame buffer that just cuts the screen in two or something. Right? So it's doing a very simple job. It's just keeping the two X messages separate. On the other hand, in the file system case, you might have some files that the private application doesn't want the commodity OS to see. And you might have other files that they want to share. And you might have some files that one private VM wants to share with this private VM, but not with the commodity OS. Um, so those things um, would basically make that file server a little more complicated than the job that we're doing here. And that, that complication is what we're trying to avoid. Right, because in a sense, that's, that's what commodity OSs are supposed to do now. They're supposed to keep your file separate from someone else's files. But then there's this privilege code problem where once you get privileges um, that, you know, system level privileges, all those, all those isolation mechanisms break down because there's, there's a way around them. The trusted display VM, yeah. is there any operating system in that? Um, there is in this case. So, uh, in our prototype, basically, we didn't spend too much time working on this. We just wanted to illustrate a mechanism for having a trusted display server. In, in the ideal case, you'd want to have this to be very minimal, like maybe just a virtual frame buffer or something, and push a lot of the X functions actually into this side. So you'd want to change the way the interface is cut right now. <laughs> 
Okay, so you, so you really do have a, you have an instance of... Yeah, uh, in essence, this is actually very big. This is running like a full Linux system within a full X server, but that was just done for... Look at display subsystems and frame buffers and, and all those kinds. That's a huge, you know, there's a huge diversity of hardware there. And no matter how you do that, that's going to have... And you look at those drivers, they're humongous. So making that TCB, you know, in, in some way secure and provably correct is... Pretty significant job. There is work that's looking at that. Um, so uh, we basically we, we basically think that they're on the right track. And the idea is just to make this into a virtual frame buffer. So you just kind of like write a bitmap to it, essentially. Of course, there's performance issues with that. I'm not saying it's, it's ready. I'm just saying that that could be one possible approach, is you just treat this as a frame buffer. You write bitmaps into it. And all the frame buffer needs to know about is what region of you know, the overall screen belongs to who. Are you going to do overlapping windows? And right. So, of, of course, there are all these issues, um, and um, people are working on that. that. That's not something we specifically looked at. Our, our resource. I mean, you look at that when you start talking about users interacting with that screen, and focus goes between the scheduling that happens between depending on where the mouse is, right. and it's going to it's going to generate scheduling that goes back to the absolutely. Um, I think isn't that private uh, OS? It's going to grow in complexity as the number of resources start, you know, as you move stuff from being just standard calls mm -hmm. that proxy back to the OS into that guy, that's going to get bigger. It's going to get there. bigger. And doing things like, well, in some cases, there is some shared data that it's going to be looking at from over there, right? Sure. So what prevents that shared data from getting compromised in such a way that you inject viruses into your private world? Um, nothing. So, so the intuition here is that, remember in the first slide, um, most attackers are not getting control of your system by directly attacking the kernel. Right? What they do is they, I'm not saying nobody does it, but usually what happens is there's some web server or some mail server that's running with these privileges. That's a much bigger code base. The sum of those things are all a much bigger code base than your OS kernel. So even if this private OS grows to be as large as the commodity OS, we still gain something because inside here, the amount of code that can hurt you is just the kernel. There's no other privileged applications in there. Yet, if this private application wants to communicate with them, it can because it can go through Proxos and through the host process to talk to them. So from its point of view, those other applications, such as a web server or um, a mail server, are all still present and accessible to it. But if they get compromised, um, they can't hurt it so to speak, because it's only exposing a portion of its interface to those applications. Does that answer your question? Well, that's actually into the discussion of going back to his about the splitting it up into just a, a network you know, set of connections. One side you're saying, well, the TCP stack is complex. And so you're using just a, uh, a network mm -hmm. and, and just having using the VM as the isolation mechanism. I don't, I don't know where the trade-off goes between the private methods associated with, you know, that are per application specific, which means they're attackable, and that, you know, it, uh, it starts to go below the place where you just say, well, if I just had uh, a network OS that just communicated out to real isolated uh, other, you know, VMs, uh, you know, where this becomes a, where you could argue this has a, one, a smaller TCP at all, so do and you, the is better. Do you imagine each different private application will be in different VMs? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so there's isolation. Well, but the size of each of the VMs is going to grow as... No, it's not going to grow in terms of the number of private applications. Each private application will be separate. And each private application will have its own private OS method set. That's right. And as those open method sets become more complex in terms of what it's... What's, what things that are not commodity that are just passing back to the, to the main OS? As it handles, starts handling those private methods, as that grows, you know, the... So, so I, I guess something that Helen is, is pointing out here is that um, this private OS, because it's private to the application, can be specialized to each application, too. So if there's functionality that the private application doesn't need, it doesn't need to be in this instantiation of the private OS. Yeah. Diamond, yeah. that's probably going to stay small. That's going to stay small. Proxy. I agree. This could, this could get bigger, but the thing is, if, if you have a private application that is already running here, you wouldn't need to add more, more functionality to it. I guess 
you can think of this private OS as also being customized to just have the minimal amount of functionality that the private application needs. And that's something you can do. But uh, 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 the main point here is that you've removed the privileged code, which is actually a much larger and much bigger source of problems in the kernel. So even if the private OS was as large as the kernel, I think we've still won. Good question. The, uh, the <clears throat> your first example was a file that was used by the private VM. Where's the file kept? Um, the file's kept inside the private OS. So the private OS will implement a simple file system. Um, the, <clears throat> is there a disk? Yeah, so the, the Zen virtual machine monitor can provide resources, the same types of resources to the private VM as it does. It virtualizes these resources and it keeps them separate. So if the private OS wants direct access to disk or to network hardware, then it can. So it has a dedicated disk drive aside. To yes. <coughs> yeah. All right, so there was a, also a question about how um, Proxos takes these routing rules and associates them with uh, requests from the, from the private application. And the way it does is, is again, very fairly, fairly straightforward. So initially, when the application wants to access a resource, it typically names a resource and says, give me a descriptor, um, like a file descriptor, that after which I can use to name this resource again. So it's really allocating a file descriptor or a descriptor for that resource. And it does this with a system called like open or something. And I'll name the name of the file. And what process does is then it does a lookup on the routing table to see if the name, the resource that the application named, appears anywhere in the routing rules. And if it does, then process takes the uh, method table here that I'm showing in green, allocates a descriptor for that resource. So in this case, it's a file descriptor, and attaches the routing, uh, the method table named in the routing rules, with that descriptor. It then returns the identity of the descriptor back to the private application. Now, subsequently, the application might want to execute other system calls on that descriptor. So when it does so, it simply names that descriptor. Process looks at that descriptor, looks it up to see if it's been opened before, and finds the method tables, and then just executes the appropriate method that's been attached to that descriptor. So this is really simple. It basically looks like the VFS layer in, in a typical operating system. So um, dealing with path names can be a little cumbersome because NC Shadow has a lot of different names, like you know, user slash dot dot slash NC Shadow. Yeah. So, process basically does the resolution um, as appropriate. So, um, the other thing is again because the rules are written by the developer, the developer knows kind of. It's actually very confusing now because if Etsy is mapped somewhere, and I open Etsy slash dot dot slash shadow, should that be the same thing as Etsy shadow here, or should it be the thing that's one above whatever the thing that Etsy was mapped to? Yeah, it's, it's not actually a problem, because remember, these rules are set by the developer, and the developer knows how the application is going to name the resources it wants to access, right? Well, I mean, if the developer, if, 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 if the developer is an oracle, why doesn't he just fix the application to not need you know, an indirection mechanism? Why not just have the application make specific requests in the first place? The developer could, but that would require more effort. This is this isn't the case where the application has already been written and it's already running on the commodity OS, and all you want to do is move it on t into the private VM with Proxos. So you don't want to change too much of the source code, but you know something about how the application works. So you write these rules that are going to be pretty small. I'll show you how small, and that gets you where you need to go instead of having to go through the source code. You could do it that way, but I think this is less effort. All right. Um, now, because our, our version of Proxos is a prototype, there are some artifacts that uh, required minor porting for some applications because essentially our, we introduced some artifacts during our implementation. So we chose to build Proxos from scratch. So there's some, some things that um, basically aren't implemented that required some porting. So uh, Proxos right now has a single address space. And so if the application tries to fork, um, the developer has to go in there and change the fork so that it's serialized because it can't create a separate address space. That, that's just a, a limitation right now. Um, again, uh, another thing is that you can't dynamically load code from the commodity OS because that would be unsafe. That code could be tampered with. Um, if we had a signing mechanism where that code could be signed and extended process to verify those signatures, then loading dynamic code could be safe. 
And also process right now doesn't uh, support multi-threading, multi uh, basically because the system calls are blocking. Everyone will block until um, the commodity OS sends an interrupt back. It doesn't really make sense to have multi-threading support because whenever a thread makes a system call, it will essentially block the whole VM. I just want to emphasize that these are basically artifacts of our implementation. They're not fundamental limitations. Um, if we work more on process and we plan to do that, we, we, we're planning to get all these things in there right now. So, uh, so it doesn't work in, the, in every case. But in a lot of cases, what we find is that uh, the actions between the child and the parent can be serialized. So one comes after another. Um, specifically, in the examples, uh, in the applications we did, typically the parent was forking so it could exec a new process. So the fork would be directed to um, the commodity OS side. So the fork ha actually happens on the commodity OS side. So the host process forks, creates a new process, and then the child execs something else and doesn't become the host process anymore. So at that point, um, uh, at that point, that, that thread of execution from the point of view of process kind of terminates because it's no longer a host process. Any open files that went across the fork, what happens to them? Yeah, those get, and only the open files on the commodity yeah. OS side would be, would be inherited by the child because the fork is happening on the commodity OS. Uh, let, me, let me illustrate because the, the application that's happening in is actually SSH. So, um, so in SSH, um, so SSH is the type of application that really benefits from Proxos because it's an application that accesses sensitive resources, right? It's accessing the password file and the host keys. And these are things that you probably want to protect uh, if the commodity OS is compromised because otherwise you'd have to run over, you know, run after all your users and get them to change their passwords even after you recover, stuff like that. So what we do is we put the passwords and the host keys in a file system that Proxos, uh, the private OS implements and whenever SSH, uh, the SSH server wants to access those, for example, to authenticate a user, a remote user, it goes through Proxos, and Proxos directs those re uh, resource requests to the private OS. But now, once a user is logged in, typically they want to get access to commodity OS resources. They want to read their mail or look at their files. So SS the SSH server needs a way of spawning a command shell on the commodity OS. And so the way it does that is um, it forwards the fork to the host process, as well as exec and pipe system calls. And those things are all executed by the host process on behalf of the SSH server. So the host process will actually fork, instantiate this command shell, and creates a pipe between it and the command shell. So now when the user is typing on the command shell, for example, and uh, there's some output, the command shell will spit that output to the pipe whose other end is connected to the host process. And now the SSH server simply read, forwards reads to that pipe to the host process. So that read will be executed by the host process. The results will then be sent to the, um, to the uh, SSH server in the private VM, who can then encrypt it, and again send it back via the host process to be sent out the network. So the encrypted information is sent out the host process to, to the network. So in a way, you can think of the host process as basically doing all the actions that the SSH server normally does, but um, if this side is compromised, you can't abuse this to basically get at those, those key resources. Um, we also ported a graphical web browser. So here the sensitive resources we're trying to protect are the user's cookies and also interaction between the web browser and the user through the graphical display. So those things are all routed by Proxos to the private OS. On the other hand, if the user wants to uh, download um, a file, for example, to be opened by a file viewer that exists on the commodity OS, for example, a movie or Acrobat file or something, the web browser will simply save those by default in the user's home directory. And then the user can, again, use the host process. Um, the web browser will actually command the host process to instantiate the file viewer and uh, read that file off the user's directory. So, um, files downloaded from the web would still appear in the, in the commodity OS kernel. Um, finally, we uh, also did a server-side application. And here we ported Apache uh, running SSL. So the sensitive resource here is the uh, signing key that's present in the uh, SSL certificate that Apache uh, would use. And we took that and the, uh, we moved the cryptographic operations that 
are done during SSL into the private VM. Now, one interesting thing that, that happened here is that Apache makes a lot of these RSA crypto requests uh, that require the signing key. And initially, the way we did it was naive. Uh, we, we would instantiate the VM every time we needed to do one and then have it tear down because the SSL is actually implemented as a library in, SS, in, in Apache. So every time you call, it's like calling a function call. And that host process would wake up, instantiate the VM. So that's, that's actually very bad for performance. So we altered Apache a bit so that the host process is actually a separate thread. So it's instantiated once uh, when Apache starts up, meaning the VM only has to be instantiated once, and then it sticks around. It's persistent until Apache shuts down. And this, this actually helps with performance. But as you can see, we'll see um, here, requires a little bit more porting effort. So in our evaluation, we talk about two costs to process. Um, one is the effort it takes to take applications and move them in the process. The other is performance. So I'm going to talk with the porting effort here. So here I have the amount of um, code that's in the routing rules in terms of lines of code. And you can see that they're fairly small. Uh, in practice, we found that once you understood the application, it's very easy to basically identify the sensitive resources and write rules for them. And the rules are not very long. Uh, moreover, um, I, I want to point out that um, the rules are local to each application, which means it's easy for incremental deployment. Once you write the rules for one application, uh, you typically don't need to touch them if you're going to add another application. Um, so as you add applications, you only need to write rules for the applications that you're adding to Proxos, because each one's running in its own VM and is isolated from other private applications. So there's very little crosstalk. Um, this is a porting requirement, so the amount of code that we had to modify in the application itself. And that's mainly due to the artifacts I was talking about. Uh, our web browser used um, graphical themes, and these are actually implemented as shared libraries, so we had to make those statically linked. Um, the SSH server uses Fork. And Apache, uh, we have to do a little more modification, basically, to get that performance, to stop it from instantiating the VM every time. So to move it into a separate thread required some porting. But in general, we're talking about a couple hundred lines of modifications for applications that are in the hundreds of thousands of lines of code or so. Now, the performance overhead, as you might guess, comes from the cost of forwarding those system calls to the, to the commodity OS. And um, the uh, cost is basically dominated by context switches that occur as a result of that forwarding. So let's count up the context switches. Um, so one definitely has to occur because at the, once the private VM forwards the uh, interrupt to the other side, the underlying virtual machine monitor has to schedule out the private VM, schedule the commodity OS. So there's one there. Now to handle the system call, the host process has to be scheduled. So the host process, uh, there is also another context switch there because whatever was running before needs to be scheduled out. Now after the host process is done executing, it has to yield the processor and typically, um, either uh, an interrupt comes from the virtual, uh, virtual machine monitor, or the host processor yields it to an idle task. In any case, when it's switched out, there's another context switch there. And finally, we have another context switch to reschedule the private VM. So we have four context switches. Now, in our case, um, the version of Zen we were using was using a round robin scheduler, which is a little naive. And Zen always requires an administrative VM to be present. And even if this administrative VM is not doing anything because of the round robin scheduler, it also gets scheduled in there. So in our experiments, we had to deal with five context switches, the last one being just an artifact of the underlying virtual machine monitor we were using. So to see um, how closely this tracks real life, um, we used a micro benchmark suite called LMBench on our system and measured the cost, minimal cost of a context switch, which comes out to just under three microseconds. So if you take this number and multiply it by five, you get 14.4. And then we compare that with the cost of various system calls, um, the overheads introduced by Prosos versus just a regular kernel running on Zen. And we see that the numbers track fairly well. Um, they're all around that, maybe a little bit less. Now these two numbers at the bottom are a little higher. And the reason for that is because both these functions, uh, both these system calls, take file names as arguments, not file descriptors, which means that the commodity OS, after the context switches, has to make some accesses to the file cache to translate that, that resource name into an inode. And that incurs additional TLB misses because on every context switch, we're, of course, flushing the TLB. In the native case, 
because you're just making a system call, no context switch occurs. So you're actually paying the cost of additional TLB misses here. Numbers that were below the expected number of delay for the context switches? We actually looked pretty hard, and um, we basically have two theories. Um, and it's kind of hard for us to tell which one it is. Either this, this number here is a little bit inflated because of the way it's very hard to actually get an accurate measurement, okay. right? And the other thing is um, there could be some beneficial things because of better cache locality because process puts everything in one, one case. We're trying to investigate that now, but it's, it's hard to get that information. So um, now what I have here is an application benchmark, um, SSH, where we're basically plotting across different runs the number of forwarded system calls versus the overhead that those runs experience over just running them natively without process. And we see that um, the number of the overhead is fairly well correlated linearly with the number of system calls. So as you increase the number of system calls, the overhead increases linearly, which tells us that it's quite likely that these forwarding system calls are the dominant source of overhead. Now what this graph isn't showing you is the end-to-end -end overhead. And that's actually quite modest. Um, our SSH server, when transferring large files over the encrypted link and process, experiences about 6% slowdown versus uh, transferring it natively on Zen. Uh, and our Apache server even experiences a slight speed up. Is that because of the optimization? Yeah, <laughs> without the optimization, it's really bad. So that, that would probably be a speed up even if you didn't use Proxos, right? I mean, you're comparing Apache in ordinary configuration to Apache with your modifications and in Proxos? Well, the thing is, uh, on the, the way that you would probably wouldn't be a speed up because on natively that SSL is implemented as a library, so it's just a function call to do it, and by extracting it out to a separate server, you are adding some overhead. So why is it getting, uh, why is it getting an end-to-end -end speed up then? Um, again, because so this is where I think actually rather than the context switch being overinflated, we're actually getting some locality benefit. Um, that we're not, yeah, we're not aware of. Um, it's, it's a very, very small number, so it, this could be noise too. It could be measurement error. But so I'm not, I'm not saying that this is actually increasing our performance. I'm just saying that the overheads are likely small within the noise. So in conclusion, um, what we found is that by partitioning the system call interface into security sensitive and non-security sensitive resource accesses, and then by routing system calls between a private OS and the commodity OS. We can isolate sensitive resources from the commodity OS, but at the same time still allow applications that have those resources to not lose functionality and continue to access resources in the commodity OS. Uh, we find that the porting effort is quite reasonable. Uh, the writing rules are short on the orders of tens of lines of code, and the rules are local to each application. So if you add a new application, that is not going to have any effect on existing applications. Uh, finally, the performance overheads are quite reasonable. Um, the overheads are low, and any overheads that you do see are likely due to context switches as well as VM startup and shutdown. So if you can uh, minimize this, then generally the overhead is not too bad. And so as we found in some cases, you do have to minimize that by modifying the application a bit. All right. So uh, any more questions? Yeah, I guess I'm still not convinced that isolating things like, and maybe you do it at a much more granular level than open, close, read, write. Uh, it provides any type of boundary between the commodity side and the, and the protected side. As long as the commodity side can touch those files directly or indirectly, it can introduce you know, data structures that are corrupted, which could have bad behaviors on the, on the trusted OS side. All right. So um, that, so I think maybe perhaps I wasn't very clear on the, the attack model that we're dealing with here. So the attack model we're dealing here with is not that there is a vulnerability in the application. What we're worried about here is that there are vulnerabilities in other applications that have nothing to do with you. So you could be, you know, you could be a godlike coder and you have an application that has no vulnerabilities, but some crappy coder has an application that's privileged and is running in the same OS as you and has vulnerabilities. And the attacker just hits that application and uses that to attack your, your application that you've worked hard on. What process does is saves you from that pain, right? You, if your application is free of vulnerabilities, which you know, is a big caveat, but let's say it is, now you put it in process and you write the rules correctly so that only non-sensitive resources are exported to the commodity OS. Even if you have crappy programmers 
you know, from other companies or whatever, writing code on the other <laughs> side. <laughs> um, and they, they, they get compromised and the commodity always gets compromised. Your application is not hurt, right? Because there's, if there's no vulnerabilities in your application, then um, they, they, they won't be able to send you bad data and have something bad happen. And um, if you do have sensitive resources, they're isolated, right? So they can't, they can't use a kernel to get at those resources. So this is really a matter of trust, right? You only trust the commodity OS as much as you need to. And if something bad happens, it's really your fault. It's not the fault of any other application. That's what we're trying to guarantee. So I hope that's a little more compelling for you. So the most compelling thing would be to put this out, or run some sort of experiment, give some, make a honey pot, give some hackers access and, and see what they can break. Because I mean, you've created a model and you've basically said in, in our model, we're less impervious to attack. And you know every model has its weak points. So it would be good to see, yeah, certain things they're just not able to do. So how, how do you, I mean, I, it's easy to evaluate performance because you build yes. the system in your own. But how, how are you going to really evaluate this uh, claim that the architecture is sort of uh, more impervious to certain types of attack? Do you, do you, I mean, it's very hard, right? I, it is know. a very hard problem. I, I think your suggestion is certainly a good one. And um, we're basically working on finishing up the artifacts that I'm talking about so that we can, uh, one of our goals is basically to port more applications, mm -hmm. possibly an entire suite of applications over um, and then just run that on our own servers. So uh, we're, we, you know, we're going to drink our own Kool-Aid, and we're going to we're going to use it. Um, but this is, you know, this has been two years of work. Sure. I think it couple, needs a couple more, you know, at least a couple months more work to to get it ready for, um, you know, before I trust my mail to it. Let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But I, I think that's yeah. I I'd be happy to entertain other other methods. But um, in our mind, we we've kind of at least from an argument and analytic standpoint, kind of convinced ourselves that it's providing the guarantees that we want it to provide. It seems like the completeness of the rules uh, will play a big part on whether your uh, security system <coughs> is really secure. Uh, you mean the correctness of the rules? Yeah, yeah. The completeness. Yeah. So how do you know that all the sensitive resources are actually pr protected? Um, right now, we rely on the application developer. So um, there is, we do have some uh, thoughts about maybe some way of automating that, but um, that's kind of future work. It, it seems like you could perhaps build a tool that analyzes your programs. If you give it some information that would tell you perhaps if this file is protected, perhaps you should also protect this file because they're used in some way that's related to each other. There's information flow between them. So that seems like something that, that could be done. Sounds like a very challenging Yes, another challenging problem. Yes. Two one is um, if there, if most real applications have shared data, where it isn't just private to the application, but there's it's a database involved, mm -hmm. and data in that database is accessed by another program. So how you would, you know, how the rules would be associated with shared mm -hmm. data? Uh, mm -hmm. rules. And still like to understand the, the comparison between just saying if I has a separate VM for the the sensitive or trusted app, full VM. It's a commodity app, but the only thing that's accessing it is that application. So there's no reason for compromise. Right? So it's yeah. a much, much reduced attack surface. Yeah. The, the only attack surface you have is it's through that application. Yes. But now the sharing opportunity. Yeah, now you don't have any sharing opportunities there. Anyway, I haven't seen this address. No, no. So, so in that world where you don't, yeah. yeah. I, I launched that app in a separate VM. So of a, a separate but you VM. want that app to communicate with right. the other. Other, other apps. So the, the the thing that he has here for that is a trusted communication channel. It's an RPC thing, which where he controls the, the path, right? <clears throat> I could I could have a full VM in that private guy. The only thing ever, that ever runs on that VM is the the shell. Yeah, but then that wouldn't be very interesting because now you have the shell. But say you want to read your mail, you launch it in the other place. Anyway, anyway. this is so almost red green, right? You're, you're going to, the shell is always launching in the commodity in the other OS. Okay. Right? I mean, no, red green is an internal reference to uh, Yeah, I, I've kind of heard of red, well, I've kind of heard of red green. Okay, great. Maybe, yep. But the thing is, it, I think it's different from red, red green because I think, so correct me if I'm wrong, but in the red green world, you have to explicitly move data back and forth between the two, right? The user has to be somewhat aware of it. That is the user model that's most often associated with red green. 
is that it gives the user control over sharing. Right. So in this case, those, those, those models are set by the application developer and somewhat extracted from the application so that the application semantics don't change. From the user's point of view, the user doesn't know this. The user just logs in and poof, they get a shell on this side. But all the information that they're, they're, they're doing, um, they're using, for example, is encrypted via this side. Like the session key, for example, would also be secure in this case, as well as the user's password file. So if the remote side were compromised, you know, the user's not going to lose their password. Sharing, I guess I think my interpretation of David is basically sharing is guarded by the application developer, the rule writers, on how that should be shared. Well, in fact, what I'm, what I'm challenging is if I had a separate picture which says private VM is a full version of Linux kernel over there, and one communication path that was set up that you, you know, that you contrived that all of the communication went back to the commodity OS for everything that the, which the shell does anyway for, for everything that it wants to communicate in terms of things that it launches and whatnot. So that this side here had a, a, a full operating system, but there was nothing that could compromise that operating system. The only thing that, that ever ran on it was the shell, which you said is clean. It's not going to do that. Mm -hmm. So compromising the shell through the, you know, by compromising the operating system, and the other app can't do it. Uh, you know, that's as good as uh, as can be. Can, can, can I amplify that point? Because I'm, I'm, that same thoughts been bouncing around in my head, so I'm going to try stating a different way, which is okay. um, the, the argument that you've made for using this little operating system and this specialized private OS on the left is that it's a smaller attack surface. But his argument is what makes the attack surface small is that you're isolated by the VM and you, and you, and you establish a, a, a deliberate pipe between them. That arrow between them right. is, is a deliberate pipe that is exactly what that, app, that private application needs to share. Therefore, it doesn't matter what else is in this OS because an attack surface, I mean, you can have gigabytes of code in there, and if it's not running, it's not an attack surface, right? So why do something special over there? Why not just, why not approach this like, well, I have another machine. It might as well be a physical machine. It's isolated. I'll install an entire operating system on it, and I'll only run the application that I care about, and I'll only connect it to the outside world via this pipe. And, you know, I, it doesn't really matter whether this pipe is a special thing that we just that we just coded up by hand, or whether it's a network pipe. The point is, this pipe only, it, the only data that goes over it is exactly what the developer says the VM needs to share. You need to put all kinds of rules around that pipe. You, you can, and, and, we, and, there are, and existing pipes have lots of rules. Right. Like, you know, you can do firewalls. It, it is a, a form of, you know, That's putting it. rules on a pipe. So, That's my argument. So, so <laughs> great, great. So the argument, so let, let, me, let me address that argument in a, in a couple steps. So first, uh, I guess several times they've gone to this, why don't, we, why don't we just use regular TCP IP? That's what you're talking about, like a rather network we're protocol? Or? What we're, we're, what we're yeah. trying to argue is that the, the, the argument again, I mean, the, the argument in favor of using TCP and an entire kernel yeah. is that it's already written. The, the, argument, okay. the, the, the argument against that you've made is that, yeah, but, but it's big and therefore it's a big attack surface. And the point is, but it's not a bigger no, attack no, no. surface. I think we're talking about, I think actually we're in agreement. Maybe there was just a misunderstanding. Because... Um, in my mind, the private OS, it's nice that it's small, but that's not the main benefit. The main benefit is exactly what you said, is that the application, the, pri the privileged applications that were here are now isolated from this guy. And you could use a regular kernel here, right? What I, but I, I do want to say that you don't want to use a regular kernel in a completely straightforward way all the time. Sort of, because... For example, TCP IP has a lot of other functionality that goes beyond a simple RPC so, interface. You have a special right. communication right. mechanism. Right. Okay, yeah. So I, I do feel that that design. On the other hand, I do, I, I do agree that um, in, our, in our system, we built the private OS from scratch because we wanted to see how small it makes it. But if you had a full kernel in there, I don't, I don't think that's really much worse than Why this do you want to at see all. How small it makes it. I guess, I guess that's that was one of our original goals, but, um... But is there a benefit in that other than sort of intellectual curiosity, right? Because, I mean, I think, yeah, I, mean yeah. I, I think there's this implication that mm -hmm. that smallness is somehow important for the goals of the project, and what um, we're arguing is that it doesn't actually have any security benefit. No, no, I, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a side benefit, but you have to put effort into it because you've got to code the OS from scratch. So there is a trade-off there that I... May, maybe it came across wrong, I, but I personally don't feel it's so clear that... There is a benefit because, in a sense, you're 
you're starting code from scratch here, so it's new. So it's likely to have more bugs in the well-established OS that might be bigger, but it's also been around longer, right? So I think there's a trade-off there that's not clear. I think the main benefit here is that even if your private OS is as big as a regular kernel, the, private, the privileged applications have been removed from that side, and that's where the majority of vulnerabilities exist. A snarky question here, and, and I don't mean it to be no, no, no. snarky, but I, I think it, I, I, there's some underlying point that I'm trying to tease out. And maybe I'm not, I can't do a good job of it yet, but the, the question is, if you had approached this problem differently, one, one of the things I've been intending to do and never really gotten around to is taking my, my, my private home server that has three or four services and said, this is ridiculous, they're all coupled. I, I really need to learn how to install Zen someday instead of the six-year-old thing I have. And I'm going to install these on separate virtual machines so that they're logically separate, physical, you know, as if they were physical machines. And I'll connect them with networks carefully. And I'll set up my firewall rules, wall rules carefully so that effectively I've got narrow pipes between them. And then and I'll deploy that. And, and you know, there's almost no programming there because I'm going to use existing stuff. And I'm going to get all the benefit that you're talking about. What, which benefit am I missing? How are you going to do this? Right? How are you going to get SSH to start up a shell on the other side? Right? The SS, SSH is used to using fork. So, so the, thing I'm, the thing I'm missing there is, is, is a way to do pipes over the other machine. Right? I mean, what, what I, can, I can do that by having um, SSH, having a connection between those two machines that where you know, a, a, a TCP connection where uh, RSH, basically, an unsecure connection between those machines. So when I, when I SSH into the SSH okay. machine, it RSHs into the other machine. And now I've found a way to forward the particular shared resource across the network. No, but then you, need, you need to add, but then you need to have um, another privileged application on this side, which is the command shell that's going to do the RSH. Right? You need to break the semantics of system call. You, yeah, yeah, but, but, but I've still protected my password and my keys. I've, gotten, I've achieved the same thing, right? Like, like what if you want to do SCP here? Like, this, we can do SCP transparently because SSH is just going to do the open the file, read. It's going to write stuff to the network. Let, let me pause it seems a like bit. significant let, optimization by doing yeah. it this way versus using the TCP. Because you, you're going to have to add a lot of code to do what you're saying. Right. So, I mean, I mean, it's not just performance. You're going to have to add a lot of code to this side to translate those system calls to do it via over the network. Like, like here, if this guy wants, if we do an SCP, we don't have, like this, this system just works. Because you, t you tell this guy to read a file and then encrypt it and send it over the network. So this guy just tells this guy to open that file, so, so send the contents back. So suppose we deploy, I mean, the, people have been forwarding system calls for a long time. It used to be for a different reason, right? We used to do it for, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. process remoting, That's right. um, for you know, transparent process yeah. migration. Right. Um, so why don't I deploy, I mean, I, I think that's a, a fine mechanism. It seems like a reasonable thing to do. Yeah. I, and I'm, I'm going to end up with a system that's not far different from yours, but by going, by going this route, you know, I'm not, instead of building a system, I'm, I'm, I'm building almost nothing, right? Maybe I have to build that, the, the, the forwarding thing to, to transparently forward uh, file right. structures. But, I mean, the, the, the benefit it has is that instead of, instead of an, a new operating system, uh, I'm, I'm, what I'm really advocating is a, a, a discipline for building isolated virtual machines. And I'm going to give you this extra tool of how to forward No, but, okay, so those systems, you're right. People have been forwarding system calls for a while, but they usually forward all the system calls, right? Another thing we're adding is the ability to differentiate. That's why we're, we're talking about splitting the system call interface here. So forwarding system calls, yeah, people have done that before. Maybe we're doing it over a slightly more efficient mechanism, but that's really because we have the benefit of running everything on a VM and we can choose the mechanism we want. Thanks very much, right? sorry. Again, I guess I want to just get back to the title, which is the main, the main insight we have is you want to split that interface. You want to split that system call interface and then use forwarding to send it to the appropriate people. So yeah, may, maybe, again, I, I want to get away that forwarding is the main contribution. It's, it's just a mechanism that we use. They can be implemented by TCPIP. You still have to build the part well, I mean, of TCPIP. But here, there. this channel, you have to build the top part anyways. Like, what does read system, like what does people, open mean? People do, um, I mean, the, the system call interposition is a, a, basically it lets you do this, you know, the, the filtering is the technique has been used a lot. I'm, I, I'm not trying to, we should declare the talk officially over since it is, but. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, you, do you want to be a favorite? Do you, do you I, actually, like, I need to practice uh, my idea of talk. Um, but <laughs> I, I guess I'm, the, the thing that was going to be snarky about the question was that, I, I mean, what I wanted to ask at some level is, 
why is I mean, if you'd written a paper entitled how to how to use separate physical machines to isolate your processes by being disciplined about thinking about where the you know about where the attack surfaces are and only forwarding the part of the resources that are, are the ones that have to be shared. I mean, if you hadn't called it an operating system, the program committee would have said, "Well, that's very cute. Anybody knows that." I mean, you know, it, I, I'm not sure. It, it feels like there's a conflation of we created an operating system with the the, the essence of of what you're isolating, and it's not so much creating an operating system. Process is an operating system. Process is a way of composing operating systems in a way that keeps the operating system separate. Right, so I can compose. I I can I'm com what I'm doing here is I'm composing the private OS and the Linux OS, and I'm composing them together in such a way that's specified by the developer, so that sensitive applications go to one OS and the other ones don't. But what, what the composition is. Do that today using separate machines and firewall rules. I mean, the firewall rules are are are, are the same. Are but the semantics are different. You're 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 talking about. I mean, you, you have to modify your application to be aware that it now has to access all OS resources via the network interface. The, 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 most of my applications do. I mean, if, if it's the like, only argument you're making is that, that's, that's, that well, I, I don't know about your applications, but making is that is that we want to extend firewalls to uh, to system calls. I mean, you know, p people have people have done systems that that forward system calls over the network, right? I mean, yeah, but then they don't. They they don't split the interface. The idea the idea behind those systems, um, at least the ones I'm aware of, are that they forward all of them simply because you want to run the application remotely. You want to have the application running on one system, but basically access resources on another system. I think there's a conceptual issue. There is a implementation but, issue. But actually, there are systems that do both. There are there's work within Microsoft. There's a product. There's a product called Self-Trusted, which uh, virtualizes the environment. Then you specify. Which, the, which resources are shared and which resources are, are private to an application. And then the, the system calls basically do that, that, that provision. So, and, and it handles things like, um, like registries by, by creating virtual registries for applications. That, well, that sounds like it's very similar to this. <laughs> it's, it's similar in a number of ways. It's, uh, um, and, the, and the idea is isolation. Uh, right. um, we've looked at it as a security mechanism. and. Uh, have come to the conclusion that it's not it's not very good because there's a there's attack scenarios where you can get around it. You know, if you know that the that the secure application you want is going to be running in a, in a separate world, you can you can you can contrive strategies that allow you. To have I think there's a question. There's a question. Uh, <clears throat> you started off. It, it seemed that because we have applications that can can attack the OS. Uh, we want to put secure applications someplace else. Um, why don't we put the applications that can attack the OS someplace else instead? So you don't know what they are. Okay, so that means you put all applications in protected in their own mediums. Yeah, in the generate, there's nothing that prevents that. In the de yeah, in the degenerate case, every application could be in its own. VM, there's nothing running the commodity OS except host processes. There's there's nothing right, there's so nothing wrong with that. In fact, so yeah. then, then your but then your trust decisions yeah, change a lot. <laughs> your, trust your trust decisions, decisions change because now you've just said because I don't I've taken out everything that can attack the OS. I can trust it. No, well, well the thing is, if you let's say the private VM was malicious, and there was a vulnerability in the OS kernel or in another application here. It could still leverage the host process to attack the OS kernel or, or those here. So um, there isn't, there's one way isolation is in the OS can't reach into here, but the private VM can still do anything that a regular process can do. Right? So the, the, the OS kernel is not gaining any security from, from this mechanism. It's purely for the private VM. Yeah, but if everything else is a private VM, then who cares if you can attack the, 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 the oh, I agree. I, that, I think that's the goal. We is that? Well, well, we've got a bunch of VMs connected by a network. Well, but the yeah. thing is, each one of them, each one, for the, the trade off there was for each one of them, you had to build a private OS that knew the behavior of the application. Right? It, it, you had to do the proxy. You had to do the thing that said, for the, re, for the sensitive resources for that app, I built the, the, the appropriate pro, uh, private processing work. I think that gets comatorially hard. 
Uh, but I, I guess I was, I, I was modeling that there, there's a sort of this big miscellaneous category of stuff that you don't understand. Yeah. And that will just sort of lump off. You know, yeah. Those will get lumped off with very few restrictions because we're right. not going to try very hard to protect them. The thing is, there, there are applications that don't have any security implication. So we leave them. We, there are always going to be these applications. So you can leave them on the commodity OS. Yeah, I guess the, 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 my, my core piece is I believe most, you know, most applications that have value, uh, the things that you want to call the, the trusted apps, right. take data from other places, take shared data. And as long as that shared data can be read by this guy and used in, in doing his job, others can corrupt it in some way. It's uh, a, yeah, but and that's, that's what most attacks yeah, are. No, this is a model, right? I guess it depends on the model that you have in mind. So the, I agree with that. I think private applications do take shared data, but they, they do know implicitly whether, implicit in every application, that at least we found, is that whether this data is going to be protected you know, by the OS or whether it's coming from a potentially untrusted source. And what I'm saying here is the ones that you think that the OS is going to protect, but the OS is not actually protecting, right? You put in the private application. And the ones that you, you, you assume could be untrusted, like the network or stuff coming from the shell, you, the application is already treating that as untrusted anyways. Right? In real scenarios that you're protecting against versus you know, uh, what we see in terms of how systems get compromised, how users get compromised. Okay. So, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Now we're really, no, really over. Well, thanks for all the questions. They've been, yeah, they've been good. good. Yeah.